Welcome to the virtual edition of the Geneva class. Thank you for your interest. We are today finishing the Upper Room Discourse in John chapter 16. So uh, I do hope, as always, that it's a blessing to you. Uh, you'll understand, I think, more deeply uh, what the Lord communicated to his disciples and what in that communication is for us, for it has application to us as believers. And I do hope, as always, and pray that uh, you're going to hear the truth and that God will be glorified. So again, thank you for joining us, and let's look at our text for today. The Gospel of John, and the title we still don't understand. John 16, 16 to 33, this is the conclusion of the Upper Room Discourse. So we begin with the words of Christ recorded by John in chapter 16 and verse 16. A little while and you'll see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. So some of the disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I'm going to the father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you'll not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Well, seven times in this section, you heard the expression, a little while. Uh, and so let's look at that for a moment. It reminds me of Psalm 30, verse 5, that says, For his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And what this psalm is saying is exactly the same thing. There, there's a while of there's suffering, and there's, there's anger, there's nighttime, but then it passes, and favor for a lifetime, and joy that comes in the morning. So uh, what does this mean? Well, it was perhaps intentionally ambiguous on the part of Christ, to say this, because he doesn't really explain it. We're left to do some speculating. Now, it could refer to Jesus' imminent death, followed by his resurrection. In other words, there's a period of time there, not very long, a few hours, between his death and his resurrection, Friday to Sunday. And that would be the little while. Or it could refer to the days between these events, the death of Christ and all of that, and Pentecost, well, it's 50 days from Passover to Pentecost and 10 days from the ascension of Christ to Pentecost. So that could be the little while. And then Pentecost is seeing him again through the Holy Spirit. Or it could refer to the church age. We don't see Jesus now, but we shall in glory. Well, seemingly though, there are two periods described by this expression, a little while. And the first uh, period, is the days of sorrow. And we can see several reasons why there's sorrow. Remember that the, the disciples had been in great anguish and, and very upset, uh, very concerned, because Jesus said that he would leave them and, and they were going to be alone without him. And so uh, they're going to experience the loss of one whom they dearly loved. They'd been with Christ for three years, day and night. And during that time, the relationship had grown. And they'd grown very close to him. 
and then he's going to leave them. So you can see the sorrow that they would experience. And then to make matters worse, in the midst of all of their sorrow for the departure of Christ, the world's going to rejoice. We're glad. He, he was an enemy. We've got to get rid of him. This man, this person, they never named him. You know, they were afraid to do that. They just called him this, this fellow. And then a third reason they would feel sorrow is the fact that they would be disappointed in what they had hoped that Jesus would accomplish. Remember the comment of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We had hoped that he would establish Israel. He would redeem Israel. That was their hope, a, a physical kingdom that could drive the Romans out. And they're disappointed now. I think they still were struggling with getting the proper conception as to what the kingdom is. But those days of sorrow would end a little while, and you'll see me again. And it's going to be changed into joy. Well, they're going to see him again when he's resurrected from the dead. And that's great joy for them. But they're really going to be greater hope and joy when things are made clear to them by the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And, of course, they would have ultimate joy, uh, as we all will, uh, in being with Christ forever in glory. And all through this, there's a progression in revelation for these disciples, meaning more is going to be shown to them, and gradually they're going to understand more. Going back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Matthew 13, when he introduced parables, that was confusing to the disciples. And Jesus explained, it's given to you to understand, but not given to them. But they had difficulty understanding, and they still complained about it. Maybe it's just they're slow to learn. And, and throughout the three years of ministry, it seems like they struggled, but gradually came to understand more and more. And I think it reaches its climax, its culmination here, uh, when we're going to see in a moment the confession of faith that they make. But then, of course, this revelation will be enhanced tremendously when Christ is raised from the dead, and they see that he has victory over death. <clears throat> and there's going to be a further revelation of Christ, a great revelation of Christ, when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will come upon them and, and reveal the gospel. And, of course, the final revelation when he returns in glory. So it's a gradual progression for them. And it is for us, of course, through the word of God, which is provided through the Spirit. And uh, for the, the 11 disciples, and we'll add two more later, Jesus is equipping them through this whole process with spiritual weapons to fulfill their commission with the knowledge that they need. Now, the first little while. Let's go back and look at that again. In Greek, the word for little while is just one word, micron. We get our word micro from it, microwave, for instance. But the fact that Jesus expressed it as a little while, he emphasized that a little while, that very fact would provide them with comfort. So they realized that their sorrow would be brief. It would not be extended forever. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a, a very difficult time to go through, but it's going to end. Now, no doubt, the first little while would be the few hours until the resurrection from Friday to Sunday. And Jesus said, he actually used the word, it could be better translated sob. You're going to sob and wail when you see Christ crucified. Uh, that was a terrible thing for them to witness. They are going to see their Lord and Master. If you look at the last point here, they, they're going to see their Lord and Master, this man whom they love dearly. They're going to see him not only die, but die a terrible, horrible, shameful death on the cross as a criminal. Only the worst people were crucified. They're going to experience that. So, of course, they're going to sob and wail. And Jesus uses this double amen or we sometimes say truly, truly, to, to stress the intensity of this experience and, and the truthfulness, the verity of this experience. Now, I think the second little while is going to end with Pentecost. And Jesus does make a, a real focus on Pentecost. He says that they will no longer inquire in that day. He's talking about in that day when the Spirit comes upon them and the Spirit comes upon them on the day of Pentecost. And 
they will no longer be asking questions. During the discourse that we've been studying for the last several weeks, Jesus received many questions from disciples, for instance, from Peter, from John, from Thomas, from Judas, or Jude. And uh, now that's going to end because the Spirit is going to provide them with all the information they need. They're not going to have to ask questions anymore. And, of course, he makes this point about asking in his name. It's a repetition. He'd said that earlier, asking in his name. And he says, up to this point, you haven't done that. And we have to stop and think. They hadn't done that. They hadn't asked in the name of Christ as we are accustomed to do in, in our prayers. They had asked, they had prayed in the name of the covenant God under the Old Testament system. They operated under those promises given in the Old Testament. But now the promises from the Old Testament not only are fulfilled in Christ, but now Christ gives many more promises, great and precious promises that will unfold before them. And so the whole environment is different. It's the new covenant. And it's a new relationship to God, as we'll see. It's a relationship to Christ. It's a relationship to the Spirit. Much more will be clear in their minds. So now those promises were fulfilled in Jesus with his death and resurrection. And as the promises are fulfilled, and as they move into a new context, a new dimension, their faith is going to have to go with them and advance to embrace this new covenant, which it does. It's quite a process. And Jesus is giving them the assurance it's, it's going to happen. The Spirit will take over. Don't worry about it. The Spirit would take what is mine and give it to the disciples. What is mine, the whole truth, all of the truth, the great doctrines of the faith, that will be taken and given to these disciples through the Spirit. They then produce the New Testament, and we have them. Now, it's interesting that Jesus never explained that little while. Uh, we attempt to understand it. We just did. Uh, and But Jesus just left the subject and went on. <clears throat> and I did find one commentator who brought forth something that's, that's quite interesting. If you talk about a little while, you won't see me, a little while you will. Those are just academic expressions. That's just information that is conveyed. Information, uh, indicative information, uh, goes to our brains. And we can process it, or sometimes we have difficulty processing it and understanding it. But we never have a problem understanding our feelings. They are crystal clear to us. So what Jesus does, he drops the subject. He, he taught that, and it's true, a little while you'll not see me, a little while you will. He wanted them to know that intellectually, but to help them really understand what's going to happen, he turned to feelings. Now, let's look at the passage again. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you'll not see me, and a little while, again, a little while and you will see me? Now look at the words that are underlined. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep, sob, and lament, wail, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Those are feelings, weeping, lamenting, sorrow, rejoicing. And we go on in verse 21, but when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought born into the world. And look in verse 22, also underline again, feelings. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Yes, we need head knowledge, intellectual truth. We also need heart experience. And that's what Jesus appeals to at this point. Now he continues to say, I've said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. 
there is much in these words that we need to look at. What's happening now? Jesus says, I don't need to ask the Father on your behalf. That doesn't mean that he's not going to pray for them, but the point is he doesn't have to pray for them because they're going to have this new relationship to God and they can come directly to God, something that they couldn't do before. They may approach the Father directly through the name of Christ, something they had not done. Their prayers, as we mentioned earlier, their prayers to this point had been issued according to the law, the way people prayed in the Old Testament. Now they would ask in his name and have direct access to the Father, and they would receive the results in the fullness of their joy, fullness of joy. Now, there's a close relationship. We've talked about this before because Jesus talked about it before in, in the Upper Room Discourse. There's a union of the Father's love, Christ's love, and their faith that he came from God. These things now mix together in their minds, in their hearts, and in reality. And so, in that day, you won't ask. We won't have to ask. They had asked questions. We talked about the questions uh, that came from Peter and, and Thomas and the others. But there are questions that these disciples had asked all the, through the three years of ministry. For instance, and this comes from Matthew Henry. There's a very good analysis of their questions. Uh, some of their questions had been just ignorant. For instance, in John 9, 2, as he passed by, he, meaning Christ, saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why is that ignorant? Don't they know the book of Job? You would think they would. The book of Job, as well as other teachings in the Old Testament, are going to teach that the people do not necessarily suffer because of a particular sin. And when we look at a person who is in straitened circumstances, uh, disabled uh, or suffering some great illness, you don't reach the conclusion that they are being punished for some particular sin. Yes, we're all sinners, but that scenario uh, that Job's friends observed and, and decided that that showed he sinned, that, that was proven to be wrong. So that's ignorant. Some of the questions were ambitious in Matthew 18, 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's very ambitious. Or in Matthew 19, 27, some were distrustful ones. Peter said in reply, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What are we going to get out of this? And some were flat out impertinent, as John 21, 21, a verse we'll later study. When Peter saw him, that is, the apostle John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Essentially, Jesus answered, that's none of your business. What if I allow him to remain until I come? The point for you is you need to feed my sheep. And some questions were curious. And this is at the time after his resurrection, before his ascension, Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Matthew Henry comments, but after the spirit was poured out, nothing of all this. In the story of the apostles' acts, we find seldom find them asking questions. And so he adds the, the end result, the purpose of this, that your joy may be full. Remember that this, the upper room discourse began with a statement by John that Jesus had loved them and he's going to show this love to the end. And it ends now with joy, that the joy may be full. Now, the sorrow that they are experiencing is not the cause of their joy. Obviously, the sorrow obscured it, but the joy is Christ and what Christ accomplishes, just like the birth pains for a woman, the joy is the birth of a child, obscured by birth pains, but the birth pains are, are not uh, the issue. The baby is the result of, uh, of the experience. And so the value of joy, as Jesus presents it here, 
is enhanced by its perpetuity. It's like a, a child is born and now you have this child. The, the birth pangs were for a moment, but the child continues and, and the joy continues. The sorrow was for the moment. Objective joy, notice this point, cannot be permanently disrupted or destroyed. That is what Christ gives them, just like peace. He gives them this objective peace, objective joy. That is joy that is there. It's not always felt, but it's there. Now, sometimes sorrow, pain, will obscure that joy, but the sorrow and pain pass like the clouds go away or like the dawn comes after the night. And the joy is there. And at that point, it becomes subjective joy that you can feel. And that's the joy that Jesus is talking about. That's the peace that he's talking about. Now, let's come back to this asking in the name of Christ. Uh, earlier, when he mentioned it back in the 14th chapter, I gave you uh, six conditions that would be necessary to ask in the name of Christ. I want to focus right now on three of them. And I think these are the three most important. If you ask in the name of Christ, that presupposes that you believe in Christ. Prayer in the name of Christ involves faith in Christ. You can't come to God and end your prayer in the name of Christ if you don't believe in Christ. And Christ is our Messiah. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And we must believe all these things that Jesus is and represents. Secondly, prayer in the name of Christ is based on his merit. If we come to God and ask for something and end it saying, I'm praying in the name of Christ, and we are thinking, I'm praying this because I'm good, because I have done so many good works, because I am a good person, because I have obeyed God and expect God to respond to that. That's not praying in the name of Christ. That's, we pray based on what Christ has done, his merit, what he did for us on the cross, his perfect life and the perfect sacrifice that he made on the cross. And thirdly, prayer in the name of Christ would mean asking for what is in line with Christ's character and objectives. It would be ridiculous to think that you could pray for something that you knew was wrong and, and contrary to what God teaches in his word and expect that to be answered. So that's not praying in the name of Christ. Faith based on his merit and in line with Christ's character and objectives. But remember, Jesus said, you haven't asked in my name before. Really, it's impossible because if it's based on his the merit of Christ, it couldn't, that isn't out there until he has died and he is raised again from the dead. So it, it cannot be done before his redemptive work and before the spirit has come. So that's why it was impossible to pray truly in the name of Christ during the time of his lifetime on earth. And the promise is now that as these prayers are answered, there will be greater spiritual understanding to those who ask for it. That will come with the Spirit. And the result of all of this is completeness of joy. And Christians should claim that joy and understand that it is right to, to have that joy. Uh, Calvin notes, we have the heart of God as soon as we place before him the name of his Son. Now, what about Jesus saying, I don't need to petition the Father? This verse 28. In that day, you'll, or 27 and 28, in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So after Pentecost, the disciples may ask the Father directly because of the Spirit. Jesus does not have to ask for them. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Why? Look at verse 28. For the Father himself loves you. It always goes back to that. It always begins with that. It begins with the fact that the Father loves the Son. And in the same metric, the same degree, the Son, Christ, loves the disciples. And in the same degree, the same metric, we should love one another. It starts with the love of God. That's the beginning point of it all. It's all about love. We've seen that. 
And so Jesus explains to them, the Father loves you. He has affection for you. And you know, John will say later that uh, it's not that we loved God, but he loved us first. And so that's a good example of it. The Father loves us. That's the ultimate reason. And they, that is the disciples, have affection for him, that is Christ, and they have believed that he, Christ, came from God. Starting with the love the Father has for the Son, and now the love the Son has for the disciples. Now the disciples love Christ, and they believe that he came from God. And you see this, this intertwining, this working together of love and faith. They reinforce each other. And the longer the disciples were with Jesus, the stronger was their belief. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. Now, they say, we understand. You're speaking plainly. I came from the Father. This is a repetition of the verse. We go back to verse 28 again. I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know. And here's the confession. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. That's their confession. And that's the final confession. And I think the ultimate uh, pinnacle of belief for them. So let's look at those statements Jesus makes. There are four of them. I came from the Father. I've come to the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. From this statement, they, and you and I, may discern four doctrines. One, Christ's pre-existence and full divinity. Two, the doctrine of the incarnation voluntarily assumed. Three, his voluntary return to God by means of his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Four, his heavenly destiny. Well, those are four significant, profound doctrines of the Christian faith discerned from those four simple statements of Christ. So Jesus is summarizing his mission in these four points. I came from the Father. That's his origin. I came into the world. That's his incarnation, his birth. I am leaving the world. That's his crucifixion. I am going to the Father. That's his resurrection and ascension. And now we take them separately. I came from the Father, his origin and his divinity. The fact that he came from the Father validates his claim to be the Messiah. Why? Because God is to send the Messiah from him to man, to represent him and to accomplish his purposes. He is the Messiah. And also the fact that he came from the Father, he was with the Father, John says that at the beginning, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. That beginning with God from all eternity validates the fact that he is God. Thus, we see his pre-existence and we see his divinity from that simple statement. Secondly, from the statement, I came into the world, his incarnation. He entered this world in a, a miraculous way, not the way most people enter the world. He was born of a virgin, and that implies his divinity. I remember a professor of mine saying the fact that he came into the world in a miraculous way does indeed imply who he is, the Son of God. And his entrance into the world was voluntary. It's a part of the eternal purpose of God. He knew uh, his, about his existence before, of course. He was cognizant of that, and, and, and he voluntarily gave up that being on an equality with God, as Paul will say to the Philippians. St. Anselm, back in the 11th century, wrote a book, short book, uh, dialogue, called Cur Deus Homo, which is uh, translated, Why Did God Become Man? And the answer for it is God became man because only man could offer satisfaction for God's wrath, and man, that uh, man who offers it, would have to offer a perfect sacrifice to achieve satisfaction for God's justice, holy justice. And so his vicarious death for us to pay the penalty for our sins and thus to deliver us from the power of sin. He had to come into the world to do that. 
uh, John will write in John 1.18, we've studied that before, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him, he has made him known. Thirdly, I am leaving the world. That's his voluntary departure. And that indicates the fact that his work was finished satisfactorily. He would say on the cross, and we'll study that in the 19th chapter, it is finished until the work was done. And he can leave knowing that. And the fact that he leaves having completed his work satisfactorily and returning to the Father, that gives us confidence in coming to God through him. Look at this passage from Hebrews chapter 10. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And fourth, his destiny. I'm going to the Father. So his presence in heaven, of course, would be a token of his coming again. And also, when he went into heaven, he is able to impart spiritual gifts. The most important, of course, is the Holy Spirit. But also, there are spiritual gifts that Paul enumerates in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're enumerated in other places in the Bible as well. And Paul points out, he ascended on high, the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and gives gifts to men. And among those gifts is his ability to intercede on our behalf. For instance, Paul will write in Romans 8, 34, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And in Hebrews 7.25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. In one sense, all that he did in his life, atonement, the power of his sacrifice, his obedience, all of this is powerful and efficacious as a continual intercession for us. It's done for us. Paul also will put these major truths into a succinct statement, not exactly the same way that Jesus did there, but a short statement, 1 Timothy 3.16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And the disciples said, ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Speaking with utter frankness. Now, he said before he spoke, spoke in figures, Although, if you look at the teaching of Jesus through the synoptics and even into the Gospel of John, much of it was plain speech, but they didn't quite comprehend it. But his plain speech now was understood and appreciated by the disciples. To what extent they understood on their own, to what extent the Spirit helped them, which I think he did. The point is, they understand it now. And this plain speech would characterize the work of the Spirit after he came on the day of Pentecost and results in the preaching of the apostles and results in their work in the revelation of our New Testament. Well, why did Jesus speak in figures? And people have been speculating about that through the years. We, we can only make guesses at it. Uh, some have said, well, he didn't want uh, his enemies uh, to know, understand fully he wanted the disciples to understand, so he puts it in figurative language, which would discourage his enemies from understanding. We do not know. Here's Calvin's thought on it. Thus the Lord permits us to be stupefied for a time to humble us by a feeling of our own poverty. But those whom he enlightens by his own spirit, he causes to make such progress that his word is familiar and known to them. If I understand what Calvin is saying, when we encounter the Bible and we have a figurative language that gives us some trouble, it causes us to stop and think 
And we don't have all the answers. We're not as smart as we would think on our own. But at the point that we are enlightened by the spirit, then we can go ahead and, and understand the word. And then verse 31. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you'll be scattered, each to his own home, and you'll leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, there are two ways of understanding verse 31. It can be a question. Jesus saying, do you really now believe? Don't you understand, guys, there's going to be a lot of suffering ahead of you, and you're going to be scattered, and you're going to leave me? Or you can take it in the sense of an affirmation of their faith. You do now believe. I believe you, yes. I accept your, your confession of faith is true. But you've got to understand, the time is coming very shortly when you're going to be scattered. Well, we don't know for sure. You can see the Greek on the second line there. The first two words can be translated, uh, he answered them. And then we have Jesus with a definite article in front of Jesus. And then the last two words, RT, pisteute, now you believe. And then you see there's a semicolon following that word, pisteute, and that in a Greek text indicates a question. They didn't use a question mark, they used a semicolon. But in the text, as they were inspired and as they were originally produced, the Greek manuscripts do not have uh, punctuation. Uh, so there is no semicolon or question mark. And you can take it either way. I prefer to take it that Jesus affirms their faith. We now believe that you came from God. You do now believe. You understand now. In any instance, it is true they're going to be scattered and be going to their, their homes and leaving Jesus alone. This is a fulfillment of Zechariah 13, verse 7. They would be scattered, confused, and isolated, quote, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. So in just a few hours, they would strike the shepherd, and the sheep would be scattered. But they could rest in the confidence of the Father's being with Christ. Jesus goes on to say, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Even though on the cross he's going to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is the realization under all of that, again, the objective truth that God is with him. He had to forsake him for a time in order that Jesus could accomplish the atonement for our sins. So in the same way, they can rest in the confidence that Christ is is with them that god is with them and they would find peace in him although there would be tribulation in the world he said before my peace i give you not as the world gives do i give to you now he's going to say i'm giving you peace you'll find tribulation though in the world but rest in the confidence of the fact that christ has overcome the world linsky makes these observations about this text as simple as the words are, so mighty is their import. They reach from heaven to earth, back again. They span both God and the whole world. On three things, the eleven are unanimous. The way in which Christ now speaks, he's speaking plainly. The wonder of his knowledge, you know all things. And the support this gives their faith on the vital point regarding Jesus. Now we believe that you have come from God and you can do all things. This is the last confession of faith the disciples made before the death of Jesus. So peace in spite of all. And you know, he doesn't really chide the disciples because they are going to be scattered and deserting him. He knows it's going to happen. He knows why it's happening. And that scattering is a part of their little while. And they enter this little while with firm faith in Christ love for him, and awareness because of what he said to them about what is going to happen. They're not caught off guard.
And then he reiterates the promise of his peace, objective peace that would sustain them through the little while and produce subjective peace. These are serene and majestic words, assuring them that the imminent suffering will pass and be replaced by fullness of peace and joy when they realize that Jesus has indeed conquered the world. We come to the end of the discourse. And I'm thinking, what did Jesus expect them at this point to remember? Of course, the Spirit would then guide them into all that he had said, and they bring to their remembrance what he'd said. What does he expect us to remember? What can we remember from this discourse? What can we carry away? Well, remember how Jesus emphasizes and repeats over and over again these statements of truth. I'm going to suggest six of them. First of all, and I think this would be the most important, his love for his disciples. And of course, his love for us, their love for each other. Secondly, I'm going to prepare a place for you. My father has these many rooms, and, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. That is an important point. Thirdly, the works. You know, he said, you're going to do the works that I did, but you're going to do greater works than I did, or produce fruit to his glory, which we looked at as they're taking the gospel to the whole world. And fourth, the coming of the Holy Spirit can't emphasize too much the importance of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And fifth, answered prayer. For the first time, they can pray in his name, and that prayer will be answered. And six, the assurance that he had overcome the world. So we end the Upper Room Discourse and come to chapter 17, the high intercessory prayer of our Lord. Very significant, very important. And uh, I hope that you will join us for that in our next study. And remember that all of these classes are archived permanently on the YouTube site, Stevens Valley Church. And you can go there and review them. So again, thank you for being a part of our, our class today. And I certainly pray that uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you all.